Pay no attention to the animal behind the curtain. Sorry about that. We didn't have the unit on, but good morning. Welcome to Faith Baptist Church. We want to begin the morning with prayer, as we always do, and take a moment to calm our hearts and put all the other distractions away for a few minutes and talk to the Lord. I want to pray for Levon and Carolyn Waters, our missionaries to Spain, and be sure and ask God to bless them today. Of course, their services are already over by now, but for the rest of the day of their ministry there. One of our... Uh, um, deacons and longtime church members and longtime Sunday school teacher, Gene Weborg, is in the emergency room right now. He had a um, some kind of episode with vertigo. If you please pray for him in just a moment. And then Matt and Mary Olson, they could have their baby at any time. Uh, Mary has had a very difficult pregnancy where she's been in contractions for the last six weeks, and they wanted her to make it at least till uh, about a week or so ago before they delivered the baby. But now. Whatever happens is going to happen here soon. So please pray uh, for Matt and Mary Olson. Let's stand together for prayer. If you want to find a place here to gather in the front, please feel free. Now you can pray right where you're standing. I want to pray for our president, vice president, members of Congress, those in law enforcement, fire and rescue, those in the United States Armed Forces, our missionaries around the world, and also for this morning's service. That'll be a meaningful time together. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we know that you are here with us, that the Spirit of Christ not only dwells within us, but when two or three or more are gathered in your name, you're, you're there in a very special way that we can't fully understand or describe. But we thank you for your presence, and we ask that you make yourself known among us today, that we'll sense you in your word, we'll sense you through our worship, through the time of prayer, and even through the warm fellowship we can have one with another. We pray for our president and vice president and members of Congress who often seem locked in a political battle that keeps us from moving forward as a country. We just pray that you'll give them wisdom, give them understanding, help them take care of the true matters at hand and, and set aside the uh, political partisanship and become statesmen. May you work in each one of their lives and bring godly counsel into their lives as you know they might have need. For the members of the United States Supreme Court who often on their own uh, make judgments based upon their own agendas or political viewpoints, but our prayer is that they will abide by the Constitution and by the promptings of your spirit. May they always remember that you are the Supreme Judge and they are not. For our missionaries around the world, we ask you to bless them today, particularly Levon and Carolyn Waters, 
that their ministries uh, this evening and throughout the week might be effective and fruitful and give them a sense of reward. For those in law enforcement and fire and rescue all through Sarasota, but those particularly from our church family and uh, the sheriff's deputy who may be on our property today, we ask you to bless these men and women, keep them safe and bless their families. And for those who are stationed around the world in the United States Armed Forces, we thank you for the safety and the freedom that they protect for us and how you use them to maintain our freedom. And we don't trust in them. We trust in you, but we know they are tools in your hand. And we pray that you will keep them safe, bless their families, and bring them home soon. And for this morning's service, as we conclude our series on, on peace and anxiety and, and how to handle despair, despondency, and depression. May you lift our spirits and give us hope and shine a light into our soul that we might see how we can faithfully serve you and cling to you in times of doubt. I ask you to bless this service and the time we have together. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we're seated, please take a moment to shake hands with those around you. Make sure everybody feels welcome. And then just a moment, we'll begin singing, Come, People of the Risen King.
what a, what a powerful song, and we need to sing it a little more powerfully. So we're going to sing that chorus again. Just get it started, Josh, then drop off just your voices. And when it says rejoice, O Church of Christ, rejoice, that implies rejoicing. <laughs> so we should sing it rejoicefully and, and abundantly and loudly. And don't worry if you're going to irritate your neighbor. They'll get over it. Just sing out strong and loud. Do the chorus again. song when we get to the message today as we're talking about having joy in the midst of despair and despondency that is the promise of the Lord thank you you may be seated a few brief announcements before we continue on with some uh, very special events today first of all the next two Wednesday nights we're going to be talking about Romans chapter 8 verse 26 through 39 it contains in the middle in there my life verse that I claimed when I was in ninth grade as a teenager here at Faith Baptist Church I chose that verse as my life verse and I want to teach up and around it and talk about it for two weeks. Next Sunday is Mother's Day. Woe be to you if you forget. Write it down. Put reminders in your phone, on your calendar. Next Sunday is Mother's Day. And be sure and bring your mom here. We have a nice gift to give her. It'll be a very uh, touching service. Our church work day is Saturday, June 2nd. If you wouldn't mind putting that on your calendar and helping us get things straightened up from the school year and cleaned up for the summer, Saturday, June 2nd. The Rise Youth Camp immediately follows that June 4th through the 8th. If you'd like to sponsor a teenager, please see either Matt or Kelsey, and they can tell you how you can do that. It's a great week. A lot of wonderful things uh, take place. If you'll notice in your bulletin, there's an index card. I'd like you to take a moment to fill out if it applies to you. The name of a loved one or loved ones who've died while serving in the armed forces. Memorial Day is coming up, and we want to honor those. The second section is... Your name of a loved one or loved ones who are currently serving in the United States Armed Forces. We're going to collect those names for another project. So please uh, fill that out and just drop it in the offering plate if you would. It'll help us for in the future. Now we have a very special occasion. We're going to dedicate uh, a brand new member of our church family, Audrey Felicity Ditchfield. So if uh, Michael and Taylor could bring little Audrey down, we'll let you look at them first. And then we're going to invite any of the family members who also want to be on display, no, who want to come down and stand here and support the family. We want to invite you to come down for the time of prayer. But look at that pretty little girl. Born into a great family. Born into a family of faith. Our church is going to pray for her and love her and support Michael and Taylor. Baby dedication is not a step of salvation for the baby. It doesn't do anything for the baby's own decision someday. It's really a dedication of the parents to raise this child up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But it's a, it's a reminder to us that we're part of that. As the church family, we are to rally around this couple, support them, encourage them, assist them, because this is an investment in the future, not just of our church, but the future of our faith. We have people who are members now who were babies who were dedicated here, who serve in our church, who were dedicated here as little children. Time goes real fast. Seems like it's slow, but it won't be long until she might be serving the Lord in some capacity here at our own church. I want to make sure that you pray for the family. Here's a little certificate for her. This is a book of Bible promises for the parents. And here's little Audrey's first Bible. If the family would like to come down and join us for a word of prayer, and maybe you all can lay a hand on the couple or on Little Audrey, we're going to pray together, and as you sit in your seat, I want to ask you to join us in this heartfelt prayer that a little Audrey at her first, earliest moment, although you look at her now, you can't see any need for salvation. It's in there, and it's going to show up pretty soon as children start to show their, their uh, willful, sinful attitudes fairly soon. Well, the Lord died to save all of us, and we want to pray that whenever she can, she will understand the gospel that's embraced by her family, watch it modeled in their lives, 
and make it her own as well. Please join me in this prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift of life, for the beauty of new life in a family, for what it does to a couple, how it changes the way they view the world, the way they view their responsibilities. And I pray for Michael and Taylor that you'll give them uh, resilience, endurance, grace, and strength, and hope, and vision, and joy for the future. And for little Audrey, that she will at the very earliest age embrace the faith modeled by her family, and she will become one of yours. We ask you to put your hands around her, protect her and shield her and mold her and bring her to you. We thank you for Jesus, that he loves infants, he loves babies, he loves children, he loves teenagers and adults. And we pray for your love to, to shower her and cover her with your grace. We pray for this whole family and our church family as well, that we'll see this as an opportunity to minister to this family and this little sweet girl. For we ask that in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, and uh, please return to your seats. And after the service, please go up and meet little Audrey and, and welcome the Disfield family. For the offering this morning, uh, for the offertory, I want to show you a quick video. It's to help you understand what we're going to be doing on Wednesday night starting May 23rd. It's called The Bible Project. It's a very interesting presentation of biblical truth, book by book, and then some of it's by topics. We might be doing the topics on Sunday morning in my Bible class, but on Wednesday nights, starting May 23rd, we're going to have a dinner at 6.30. It'll be pizza or hamburgers and hot dogs, a light dinner, and then gathering here to watch these short videos and then discuss them. This is an example of what it will be like. This is the book of Ecclesiastes as presented by the Bible Project. Let me ask you to, for the ushers to come forward for the offering. We'll pray and we'll collect the offering while this video plays. Father, we do thank you for the wonderful privilege we have to give and, and the, uh, the, the hope and the promise and the potential of, of effective ministry that you accomplish through our faith and through our cheerful giving. And we, we're always humbled by how you have provided for our church for all these many years. And we ask you to help us to be faithful in our giving, but to also give without a sense of obligation or burden, but of, of joy and opportunity and the idea that we're planting seeds not for our own uh, blessing, but to bless our community and to, to preach the gospel and to minister to one another's lives. I ask you to bless each person who gives this morning and bless this offering and multiply it as you always do. In Jesus' name, amen. The book of Ecclesiastes, it's part of the Bible's wisdom literature and it opens with this line, the words of Kohelet, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Now in Hebrew, the word Kohelet, it means someone who has gathered people together. And in this case, it's to learn. So it's often translated in English as teacher. And the teacher is said to be a son or a descendant of King David. And so there are different views about who this figure might have been. Many think that it refers to King Solomon, others to maybe one of the later kings of David's line. And still others think that it's actually a later Israelite teacher who has adopted a Solomon-like persona as a teaching aid. Whichever of these views is correct, the key thing is to recognize that the teacher is a character in the book and is different than the author of the book who remains anonymous. So we do hear the teacher's voice for most of the book, but it's actually a different voice, the author, who introduces us to the teacher in the first sentence and then at the end concludes the book by summarizing and evaluating everything the teacher just said. So the author is someone who wants us to hear all that the teacher has to say and then help us process it and form our own conclusion. So what does the teacher have to say? Well, the author summarizes the teacher's basic message at the beginning and right at the end. And it's Hevel, Hevel. Everything is utterly Hevel. Now, most English Bibles translate this word Hevel as meaningless, but that doesn't quite capture the heart of the idea. In Hebrew, Hevel literally means vapor or smoke. And the teacher uses this word 38 times in the book as a metaphor to describe how life is, first of all, temporary or fleeting, like a wisp of smoke. But secondly, also how life is an enigma or a paradox. Like smoke, it appears solid, but when you try and grab onto it, there's nothing there. 
So there's so much beauty or goodness in the world, but just when you're enjoying it, tragedy strikes and it all seems to blow away. Or we all have a strong sense of justice, but all the time bad things happen to good people. So life is constantly, it's unpredictable, it's unstable, or in the teacher's words, like chasing after the wind. Hevel. Now that's kind of a downer. So why is he saying all of this? The author's basic goal is to target all of the ways that we try to build meaning and purpose in our lives apart from God. And he lets the teacher deconstruct these. So the author thinks we spend most of our time investing energy and emotion in things that ultimately have no lasting meaning or significance. And he lets the teacher give us a hard lesson in reality. You can see this most clearly in the opening and closing poems, which focus first of all on time and then on death. So the teacher says, you can spend your whole life working and achieving because you think that makes your life meaningful. You should really stop and consider the march of time. For all of the human effort that takes place in the world, nothing really ever changes. So sure, we develop technology and we build nations that rise and fall, but go climb a mountain and see if it cares. It was there long before any of us and it will be here long after. I mean, no one's even going to remember you or anything you did a hundred years from now, but that mountain, it'll still be there. And the ocean will still be breaking on the beach and the sun will still rise and set. And so time will eventually erase you and me and everything that we care about. And if that's not disheartening enough, the teacher also can't stop talking about death all the way through the book, but especially in this poem near the end. He says, death is the great equalizer and it renders meaningless most of our daily activities. It devours the wise and the fool, the rich and the poor, no matter who you are, what you've done, good or bad, we're all going to die and it's inescapable. So with these two ideas in hand, the teacher goes on to consider all the activities and false hopes that we invest our lives in to find meaning and significance, like wealth or career or social status or pleasure. So you think working hard is going to make life worth it? Think about the stress and the toll that that takes on you, all the anxiety and the sleepless nights. And by the time you actually earn some wealth, you're going to be too old to enjoy it anyway. And then by the time that you have to pass it on to someone, they may not even be someone who cares about anything that you did. Or maybe you think pleasure is going to make life worth it for you. Go for it. You know, live for your vacations, live for the weekend party. Monday always comes. Hevel, hevel. Everything is utterly hevel. So what does the teacher advocate then? That we become pure hedonists or relativists? Well, no, that would be Hevel too. The teacher acknowledges the ideas from Proverbs that living by wisdom and the fear of the Lord, that these have real advantages. On the whole, life will probably go better for you. See, but the problem is that even living by wisdom and the fear of the Lord, they're Hevel too, because they don't guarantee a good life. Good people die tragically and horrible people live long and prosper. There's just too many exceptions. And so even wisdom is a hevel. Again, not meaningless, but an enigma. Wisdom doesn't work the way you think it should all of the time. So what's the way forward in the midst of all this hevel? And here, paradoxically, the teacher discovers the key to the true enjoyment of life under the sun. It's accepting hevel. It's acknowledging that everything in your life is totally out of your control. About six different times at some of the bleakest moments in his monologue, the teacher talks about the gift of God, which is the enjoyment of simple, good things in life, like friendship or family, a good meal or a sunny day. You can't control these things. You're certainly not guaranteed them, but that's their beauty. When I come to adopt a posture of total trust in God, it frees me to simply enjoy my life as I actually experience it, not as I think it ought to be. Because even my expectations about what life ought to be are ultimately hevel, hevel. Everything under the sun is utterly hevel. And so the teacher's words come to a close. Right here at the end, the author speaks up again and he brings it all to a conclusion. He says, the teacher's words are very important for us to hear. He likens them to a shepherd's staff with a goad, a pointy end, which might hurt when it pokes you, but he says the teacher is trying to poke you to get you to move in the right direction towards greater wisdom. 
The author then warns us that you can actually take the teacher's words too far, and you could spend your whole life buried in books trying to answer life's existential puzzles. Don't try, he says, you'll never get there. And so instead the author offers his own conclusion, and it's this, fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of humans, for God will bring every deed into judgment, every hidden thing, whether good or evil. And so the author thinks it's good to let the teacher challenge your false hopes and remind you that time and death make most of life completely out of your control. But what gives life true meaning is the hope of God's judgment. The hope that one day God will clear away all of the heaven and bring true justice to our world. And it's that hope that should fuel a life of honesty and integrity before God despite the fact that I remain puzzled by most of life's mysteries. And that's the wisdom of the book of Ecclesiastes. Wow, that was really good. Let's stand and worship. That should make you worship, amen? So the next song uh, talks about the Lord reigning, which is so fitting because as it was so well uh, communicated through that video that at the end of the day, God is in control. He is reigning upon his throne, and our job is to trust him and depend on him. So let's sing this together. Hallelujah. 
in Jesus' blood and righteousness. I do not trust the sweetest friend, but wholly trust in Jesus' name.
Thank you, and please be seated. What a wonderful reminder that life is heaven, but Jesus is the rock, and we can trust in Him and rely upon Him. And if this is your first Sunday in the last few weeks, I would encourage you to listen to the last two uh, Sunday sermons, as this is the third in a series on uh, why don't believers have peace. And the first two, we talked about the anxiety that we have in our lives that we can manage by the way that we think or pray or spiritually interpret things. But today I want to focus on that type of despair that comes from another source and one that you necessarily can't control. And it might be a strange topic for, for church, but from my experience as the pastor here for 26 years and as a pastor for 40 years and uh, back in 1979, when I was choosing what I was going to major in for my master's at Liberty, I had to decide between a number of different uh, fields of endeavor, and for some reason, counseling sort of jumped off the curriculum page and, page, and I chose to take counseling courses. So I thought, if I'm going to be a pastor, I want to be able to counsel people and uplift. So all that experience, and watching my own life, things that I've been through, I can tell you this is a, an incredibly relevant topic for Christians to hear. And it might not be for you today, but the odds are it will be for you sometime in your life. The statistics are, are pretty uh, dominant and even fearsome of how many people at some time in their life suffer from depression. Maybe you've already done that, maybe you do it in cycles, or maybe you're headed that way, but I want to address it today from the Word of God as, in terms of how can we view this thing that plagues so many people. What is depression or depressive disorder? Feelings of severe despondency and dejection that affect how you think, how you sleep, how you eat, how you work, how you relate with other people. It often accompanies uh, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, or any prolonged illness. And depression can come from harmful thought patterns, but you're thinking improperly. It can come from a, a spiritual weakness you might suffer from. It might come from physical or mental fatigue. It might come from toxic relationships. Or it can come from a brain dysfunction. And the point for this series is that whatever the source of despondency, despair, or if it gets to the point of depression, it always affects the whole person. You can't separate your mind and your body and your spirit. They are intricately connected and intertwined. So if you are suffering from depression today, or if you're coming out of one, or if you're heading towards one that you don't know of, once you get there, it will affect everything that you are. If it lasts for more than two years, it's called persistent depressive disorder. Some of you have been familiar with seasonal affective disorder, where the seasons bring about a, a blueness that you can't seem to shake when there's no sunlight, or some people call it cabin fever. Um, there's a postpartum depression. After a woman gives birth to a baby, her, her body chemistry is so greatly modified and adjusted, there is a, a tremendous drop that can last for two or three weeks and sometimes even longer. Well, the treatment for depression often is antidepressants, and many believers are opposed to that, so they'll take health supplements instead, like St. John's wort and omega-3 fatty acids and something called adenosomethionine, or S. AMEs, or you go to psychotherapy, or you go to counseling, or you get life coaching. In severe cases, people try electroconversion therapy, and that's not electric shock therapy from the 50s and the 40s. It's a different style that has no pain involved, but it sort of reboots your, your mind. But when the source of depression is rooted in the brain itself, as opposed to the mind, and those aren't the same thing, or your spirit, it's often unavoidable and inevitable. And the best you can do as a believer is to effectively manage it by exercising your faith, thinking correctly and directing your thoughts, and then maybe changing your lifestyle to make it more healthy. Depression is not limited to people who've endured failure. It's not limited to people who have great hardship. And it's not limited to people who've suffered tremendous loss. It affects male and females alike from every strata of life, the rich and the poor, the healthy and the sick, the popular and the lonely, the young and the old. There really is no distinction. Almost 6% of all men and almost 10% of all women 
in any given year will go through a depressive period. And I want, I want you to do me a favor, and because some of you are embarrassed by the idea that you might be depressed or have suffered from it. So I want you all to close your eyes for a moment. So nobody's looking around but me. This is just for numerical statistics. How many of you will say, at some point in time in my life, I struggled with depression? Would you quickly put your hand up? All right, you can put them down. You are a sad lot of people. No, that was like 80% of us. 80% of us said, yes, I've been there. But oftentimes the church looks at depression as being a weakness in your character or a flaw in your personality or deficiency in how godly you are. And I think we're going to see today that depression often can be something else entirely. People who are depressed, uh, depressed do not need our disdain. They don't really need our pity. But people suffering from depression can greatly benefit from understanding, compassion, and support. Jesus said to us, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you were depressed, you'd want to have understanding, compassion, and support. Paul wrote that if you're overtaken in a sin, you're supposed to react in a certain way, and you could apply it to depression. Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourselves, lest you also be tested in that way. That's why the Bible tells us to encourage each other, comfort each other, edify one another to support one another? Why does he say that? Why does the Bible say exhort, comfort, and encourage, and edify? Because we need it. We tend towards the negative. We get overwhelmed by life. We get aggravated by the hevel that you can't really grab and hold on to anything, and it disturbs us. It's affected some famous people in history. Michelangelo fought depression. Isaac Newton, Abraham Lincoln, Mark Twain, Calvin Coolidge, Winston Churchill, and one of the greatest preachers of all time, Charles Spurgeon, who often had to take months away from the pulpit to deal with his depression. Very, very powerful men. In the Old Testament, there were some prophets, men of God, who, even though God used them greatly and the, His power flowed through them and they impacted their nation, they vehemently and passionately complained and lamented and anguished in their emotional suffering. Job, who after his physical affliction said, May the day perish on which I was born, and the night in which it was said, a male child is conceived. Job wished he had never been born. Elijah, after one of the greatest spiritual victories in history, Beats all the prophets of Baal. God sends fire down and burns up the altar. He gets a little threat from a woman and he says, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Jonah, because of his own nationalistic pride and resentment and prejudice against the people of Assyria who lived in Nineveh, after he went in there and had another great revival where the whole town turns to godly faith, he says, oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. The great prophet, psalmist, shepherd, David, who really struggled emotionally, and it's all through the Psalms, we would often say, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? In one of the Psalms, he said, I am troubled, I am bowed down greatly, I go mourning all the day long, I groan because of the turmoil of my heart. Then Moses, facing the overwhelming responsibility of leading two million up to two million Jews through the wilderness, said, I am not able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. If you, talking to God, if you treat me like this, please kill me here and now. Moses. Then you have Jeremiah, the great weeping prophet, wrote two books of the Bible, got so disenchanted and discouraged in his ministry and feeling alienated from God, listen to what Jeremiah said. Oh Lord, you deceived me. You overpowered me and prevailed. And then he says in his statements, I will not mention him or speak any more in his name. Woe is me, mother, that you have borne me. Well, that's the Old Testament. They didn't have Christ. They weren't Christians. 
Listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians. We do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. One of the definitions or one of the symptoms of depression is wanting to die, wishing you had never been born, begging God to take you out of the sweet relief of death. That's, you're depressed. Job, Elijah, Jonah, David, Moses, Jeremiah, Paul. And none of us here are even worthy to be listed among those guys. Yet they suffered with this thing called depression. Paul, though, went on to say in the very next verse, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves but in God, who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will deliver us, you also helping together in prayer for us. So Paul said, although we despair of life, we're going to trust in God and we're trusting you're going to pray. There's a, a, commune, a community, a commonality among believers. But we have to apply that. God often brings burdens into our life to strengthen us. Yesterday I was walking at Benderson Park and there was a person walking in front of me who was wearing uh, wrist weights. And the wrist weights were so that when you do this, you get your heart rate going up and maybe even working your muscles. It's to, it's to increase your workout. But the person was walking like this. They weren't moving their arms. And I couldn't help but laugh thinking, you got weights on your wrist, you're getting no benefit whatsoever other than stretching out your ligaments in your shoulder and the ligaments in your wrist. If you don't deal with the burden, it's not doing you any good at all. So when weights are attached to us and burdens come in, it's to exercise our faith so that we become stronger people, even if the weight never goes away. And we always feel it. There's always a purpose behind it. So here's a few truths I'd like to share with you. Number one, it is a perfectly appropriate exercise of faith and spirituality to express to God your sorrow, despair, confusion, sense of hopelessness, and disillusionment. Even when you feel like he doesn't care or that he has abandoned you. It's still an expression of faith. To open up your heart, you know why it's faith? Because you're not going to fool God anyway. If you're despondent and you're, uh, you're grieving and you're mourning, and you say, this is the day that the Lord has made, I will rejoice. God's not fooled by that. God knows in your heart you're crumbling. He knows it. So you're saying to God, God, search me and know me and try my heart, and you pour it out to him. And the pouring out is often therapeutic itself. You can still believe and know that God does care and God is with you even when you don't feel like it. And we get so used to living by our feelings, we often set what we know aside. We've got to bring what we know is true and put it in front of us so that our feelings can go through that filter and it would strengthen us. Speaking your anguish, voicing your fears, expressing your despair to God, in my mind, is simply honest prayer. God can deal with our frailties and our inconsistencies. Uh, he's hung around from the moment he saved us. He doesn't leave us because we're not worth his time. He already knows what we can and cannot do. So he says to us, let it go. Give me your cares. On the bottom of your uh, notes, I believe, let me check to make sure. I think I put the list of, yeah, there's four books there. I'd like to recommend that you... Um, by, if you're struggling with depression, or know somebody is. They're excellent books on a Christian perspective on depression. Then there's a wonderful website by Dr. Carolyn Leaf that you can go to on drleaf.com. I think she was mentioned at the uh, Priscilla Shire conference that has wonderful information. But one of those authors is Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, and he said this. He's a physician who then became a superb Bible teacher. Many Christians are in utter ignorance concerning this realm where the borderlines between the physical, the psychological, and the spiritual meet. And they treat those whose trouble is mainly physical or psychological in a purely spiritual manner. If you do so, you not only do not help, you aggravate the problem. So don't fool yourself 
And don't let anybody talk to you about when you're pouring your heart out to God in complaint and lamentation and grieving that that's sinful. It's honest prayer. And you give it to God and you're releasing it to him because it's beyond your ability to grasp what he's doing in your life anyway. Job had no idea what was going on in his life. Imagine your life just unraveling to the point that Job's did. He didn't get a clue and God didn't ever really tell him. God just said, look at me. There's your answer. I'm God. Were you there when I made the heavens? Were you there when I, when I uh, filled the basins with ocean? Were you there when I raised up the mountains? Can you stop the behemoth? Can you stop the Leviathan? God said, just look to me and trust me was his answer. Truth number two, the brain is the most complex organ in the human body. And like any other organ, it can suffer an injury, have a malfunction, contract a disease, or anything else that an organ can suffer. The brain governs and maintains the entire body by sending neurons down the spinal cord. These neurons then communicate to the other neurons in the part of your body, and they do that chemically, and one of the chemicals is dopamine. That it's the neurons communicating to the neurons telling the body what to do, and dopamine is one of those things that make you feel good and lifts your spirit. Where those neurons connect at the synopsis, they communicate chemically, and one of the chemicals is serotonin. Serotonin gives you a sense of well-being and happiness. And then when the body communicates through that way, through the neurons and the neurotransmitters and the synopsis, and it's all communicating, and then your body releases adrenaline, as it's being told to by the brain, adrenaline gives you energy and uh, an upbeat, uh, uh, positive feeling. Imagine if your body is not producing dopamine, serotonin, and adrenaline. You can read the Bible all you want. You're going to be reading it like this. Your body is shutting down on you. And it's a legitimate, real issue that the church oftentimes just overlooks and says, pray. But last week I mentioned to you that we would not tell somebody who has a gunshot wound to repent of being wounded. And we wouldn't tell somebody who has a broken arm to go read scripture about healthy arms. We wouldn't tell somebody who has um, had a heart attack that they need to change their perspective on life. You treat the physical malady because it's real and it's tangible. Some depression is physiologically based. And we don't do anybody any favors by over-spiritualizing it and telling them otherwise. We're not providing them real help. If somebody's thirsty, what do you tell them? Pray for water? Or so, here, here's a drink. If they don't have any food, you, you give them something to eat. That makes perfect sense to us. But for some reason, when somebody's in depression, we sort of want to get away from them. Because we don't, you know, they're, they're bad. You, you might even catch it. Or they don't have good faith. Or they're not a good Christian. But it's just as physical, it could be, as any other physical need we might have. Number three, truth number three, when the origin of your depression is internal, that means it's physiological, the depression may still be a response to an external force by the buildup of the stress. So even when you don't actually recognize it or conscious of it, your brain dictates how you respond to everything that happens to you and all around you. In a way we don't fully understand, your mind is housed within your brain. The brain's the organ, but the mind is who you are. It's how you think. The brain just makes that chemically possible. As you're functioning any given day, you do something with your right hand. What makes that hand do this when you want it to do that? Is it telepathic? Are you sending a thought through the airwaves down to the fingertips and it does that when you want it to? Or is it being sent through chemicals and electrical connections? It's that. Even my will being exercised is an exercise in physiology generated by my will but my will is housed in a brain that can be greatly affected by chemicals. In the same ways that your eyes, your ears, your hands, and your tongue retrieve information from the surrounding world around you through physical interaction, your brain does the same thing. Your brain takes all the information coming from your senses, it interprets it, and then it releases out a response to your body, and it does it in milliseconds. 
That's why there's no delay when you put your hand on a fire. Your hand, your hand comes out immediately. That whatever sense is there comes back to your brain, and your brain says, get out of there, and you do it without going through that process. You know, I think that hurts. I think my finger is melting. I think I should remove it. I should remove it now. That's not how it happens. It seems like it's intuition. It's your brain doing its work. But what if that connection is shut off? That's what anesthesia does. That's why they can cut on you and sew you up when you're asleep because they've severed that connection from your brain to the nerves. Yet we deny that when it comes to emotional issues. The other thing to keep in mind is, you know, if your eyes go bad, you get glasses. If your ears go bad, you get hearing aids. If your hands hurt, you put on balm. If your taste buds go, you're just out of luck. Might as well go ahead and kill yourself. Um, but if your brain is not properly interpreting the information received by the eyes, the ears, and the nose, and all of your senses, it doesn't respond correctly. So when your body's tired, you sleep. When your legs hurt, your arms hurt, you give them a rest. Your brain needs rest. And not just your mind. TV and internet surfing is not resting your brain. That's actually stimulating your brain. It might be resting your mind because it sort of shuts off, but your brain is having to receive this light flickering, and it's having to do something with it. That's why they say don't watch television and surf on the Internet right before you go to bed. Because although you're getting sleepy, your brain is firing, and it can't relax. It takes a while to come down from that. We need to let our brains rest. Truth number four, there is no known cure for organic or physiological depression, but there are ways to treat it, to manage it, to reduce its effect to limit its scope and shorten how long it lasts. And they revolve around things like medication, diet, exercise, uh, meditation, sleep, and prayer. All those things can help. But here's a little, quick little outline. Do what you can to enhance your brain chemistry. And that would probably start with diet. It might start with the addition or the removal of caffeine, any kind of stimulants, but enhance the brain chemistry, correct the lifestyle, that might be creating inordinate amounts of stress that your brain has to function through to release the adrenaline. Establish healthy thought patterns. Think biblical truth and meditate on the truth, not on the fear that's in front of you. Oftentimes what gives us so much stress is not going to happen anyway. But we are reacting as if it does. And it wears us down and destroys even our faith. And then address the spiritual factors. So five things to keep in mind. For those who are suffering from depression, or if it ever happens to you, reestablish routine in your life. When you're depressed, one of the first things to go is routine. You are guided by your feelings. So if you don't want to get up, you don't get up. You don't want to go to work, you don't go to work. You don't want to clean the house, you don't clean the house. You don't want to wash your car, you don't wash the car. You want to eat, you eat. You don't want to eat, you don't. It's purely the way you feel governs everything that you do. If you feel like eating... Drinking, sleeping, laughing, whatever, you pursue that, but it doesn't fill you. It just leaves you wanting it the very next day. What routine does, because we are a routine-oriented species, routine and responsibility, scheduled eating, scheduled sleeping, working, restoring that sense of, this is what I have to do, get your minds off what you want to do. If you have the opportunity to simply live what you want to do every day, all of a sudden life becomes heavy. But when you have something you have to do, that routine can literally save your brain. Reestablish routine. Schedule relaxation. That's time to disengage, time to calm down, unwind and refresh, time to breathe slowly. If you don't give your brain time to shut down, it will eventually just shut you down. And we all know what that's called. It's called a nervous breakdown. That might not be the technical term, but that's what we all call it. The brain says, enough! I'm going to shut you down so I can get some rest. You need to let your brain relax. It's a great time to appreciate, absorb, and enjoy the many blessings that God has given us. Take time to appreciate Sarasota. Walk out in the sunshine. Take a walk in the woods. Sit at the beach. Sit by a lake and relax. That's not just laziness, it's therapeutic, and it's good for us. God made us to interact with this beautiful world he gave us. 
God made the ocean, he made the beach, he made the mountains, he made the streams, he made the trees, he made the blue sky, he made all the birds, he made all the animals, he made your pet, he made the singing birds for us to enjoy. You deprive yourself of that, you're going against God's design. God, God made us sensual creatures. And don't use the word sensual as necessarily sexual. Sensual means to interact with our senses. That's why it feels good to feel the sun on your skin or feel the breeze across your face or to feel a soft pillow on the back of your head. God made communication to be invigorating. God made sex to be pleasurable. God didn't make the world blasé and Satan comes in and makes it all good and says, come over to my world. God is the one who made it all to be pleasant. And we often deprive ourselves for some purpose that we don't see, and we don't even relax. We think working ourselves to death honors God, and it, it doesn't. Enjoy recreation. Exercising releases endorphins, where you get euphoria from, and it's also an analgesic. It can be a sedative. Vitamin D from the sunshine itself helps energize and refresh you. Fun and laughter are incredibly therapeutic. There are massive studies out there now about the good that it does to laugh, what it releases in your body. The trouble is when you're depressed, you don't, even when you're laughing, you're not really laughing. You're like laughing through a veil. You're, <laughs> and you know it's funny, you know you should laugh, but it's not coming from here, it's just coming from here. It's a, it's a, it's a trap that you can't get out of because you're feeling nothing genuinely good. All you sense is bad. And you feel that deeply. Laughter is a medicine that you should seek in some way to add to your life. Laughter, they tell us, exercises the, your facial muscles. If you ever laughed really hard, notice how much your stomach hurts afterwards. It, it affects your muscles. It increases your heart rate. It makes you breathe faster, so you send oxygen to your, the tissues. It burns calories. It increases blood flow and strengthens your immune system. That's why people pay big money to hear comedians. There's something that, that happens to our bodies when we laugh. So we pay people to make us laugh. It's an amazing thing that God has done for us, and I think we should learn to laugh at ourselves, not take ourselves too seriously, and learn to laugh at life. The pure um, hevel of it all, just laugh. What can else can you do? That somehow that one terrible driver in Sarasota always pulls right in front of you? How does that person always find me? And just laugh at it. Life just has difficulties. Uh, number four, get rest. The fourth commandment is Sabbath. Could be just one day of the week, Saturday. Certainly was in the Old Testament. New Testament believers think it's just one day out of seven. But even at that, we don't observe it. Rest. It's a commandment of God. That means God designed our bodies to have to have rest. If you don't have rest, you don't have relaxation, you don't have routine, you're, build, you're building the foundation for depression to hit you like a tsunami. I'll skip to the next one. Re Reprioritize your responsibilities. Reduce your commitments and obligations to what you have to do. Paul talks about putting off and putting on for your spiritual life. Well, it's also true for your mental well-being. Let go of the things you don't have to be thinking about and narrow it down to what you need to do. Reprioritize the things that you, uh, you consider your responsibilities. Give some time to meditation. And by meditation, I don't necessarily mean meditating on the um, great, um, existential thoughts of, of life, but meditate on God and His goodness, on the Word of God. Philippians 4, 6 says this, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And the God of peace will be with you. It might not take away the despair because that despair might be wrist weights that God put on you for you to do this with. So you get stronger. But it'll help you manage it and get through it and become a wiser, more compassionate, stronger person. Sometimes the hardship in your life comes in your life only so that 
you can reach over here and help somebody who's now suffering the same hardship that you went through. And God is saying, I'm going to give you my grace and strength for that person. And I'm going to take years to do it in you. So you can reach down and pull this person out of the morass. And lastly, and I don't know anything about this to tell you the truth, but it's, it's medication. I put the RX on there. Appropriate medication that restores your body and your brain's chemicals. Uh, some of you are opposed to that and psychiatric medicines, but if you're opposed to medicines and you drink coffee every day, guess what you're doing? You're drinking a medicine every day. If you eat chocolate, you're eating a medicine every day. If you take vitamins, that's a medicine. And we need to be careful that we just don't throw the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to our body and give it some thought. You don't have to do it. I'm not even recommending medication. Just perfectly consider the wisdom of it. It might apply to you. The last thing I want to say is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 through 16. I know we've gone over, but I thought this was just so important to cover today. This is Paul writing, and listen to the words. We have this treasure, life, faith, in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. In other words, when God saved us, he didn't give us Superman bodies. He kept us in the same earthen, crumbling body so that what comes out of us is from God and not us. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but we're not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, they're heavy. But the things which are not seen are eternal. And this message today, I'm not preaching at you. That's not my intention is to encourage and edify anyone here who's ever been through depression, first of all, to not condemn yourself for suffering from it. If you're in it now, don't condemn yourself and judge yourself as being a weak Christian because you can't seem to lift your head up or get out of bed. Just recognize it for what it is, a human frailty of being a believer in an earthen vessel and, and look to God and ask Him to open up to you the avenues through which He'll give you grace, knowing that he may never relieve that burden. It might be what he's put into your life, and that is the struggle for which you will be rewarded when you get to the judgment seat of Christ. How you handled the burden I gave you. Not everybody's going to be Billy Graham. Not everybody's going to be a gospel singer. Not everybody's going to be a Bible teacher or an author or a church builder. Most of us aren't. We're just everyday Christians. Well, the rewards are the same. You deal with what God has put into your life. Exercise those weights and watch what God does in you and, and through you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you are the God who designed us, created us. You designed this entire world with incredible, intricate complexities that we, to this day, still do not understand. There are physical issues and spiritual issues and mental issues through each one of our lives, and we often get surprised by them, knocked down, overwhelmed, beaten down. And we confess to you that we are a needy people. Father, I pray you'll help us not to condemn and judge those around us who are depressed, but instead see that maybe you've put us in their life to lift them up. And maybe someday we might need that same lift up from someone else. Give us humility. Give us grace. Give us mercy. Give us the very love of Christ and the spirit of Christ, the attitude of Christ. 
they would humbly serve others and be a light in their darkness. And Father, I pray right now if there's somebody here who knows exactly what I'm talking about because they've been through it and they've been beaten by it many times, yet somehow they, they keep getting back up, that you will encourage them that, that you see their struggle, that you're pleased with their not quitting, that you will strengthen them and someday there is a reward for having gone through what they've gone through. Let them sense, express, and believe the trust they must have in you instead of the worry and the anxiety and the fear and the despair that comes with life's hardships. Let me ask you to take a moment right now to ponder in your own heart since about 80, 85% of you raised your hand and said, you've struggled with depression at least once. Take this moment now to ask God to fortify your heart with his grace, his mercy, his truth. And then maybe ask him to lead you to somebody that for some reason you can be the one to lift them out of despair. Look outside yourself to the presence of God and the opportunity to serve. Heavenly Father, as we close this service in prayer, there might be somebody here who has never been able to access the peace of God because they have never personally responded to the truth of the gospel, the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross to save us and freely gives us eternal life, forgiveness of sin, and the presence of a spirit. And they're just grabbing for straws in life, trying to get through the day. May you convict their heart right now that their peace will begin with accepting the Prince of Peace for who he is, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Lord. May that begin for them today. For those of us who've been believers for years, yet we still find ourselves tripping and stumbling and struggling with emotional despondency, Father, help us learn from your word, learn from your spirit, and learn from life a more effective way to cling to you, to serve you, to be faithful to you. Teach us how to pray genuinely, sincerely, honestly, that we might gain grace to help in time of need. Father, may you touch each person who came today, those who are watching on live stream, those who might even listen to this on CD or hear it later. That you use the truth of your word, the beauty of your design, the promise of your sovereign control of all things to help us have a rock in the middle of the hevel of our lives. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope that didn't get you too depressed. After church today, we'll have a Bible class in here. We're in James chapter 5. We're going to finish the book of James today here in the class in here. And we'll start a new study there in a couple of weeks. Next Sunday is Mother's Day. There will not be Sunday school afterwards. So you can uh, effectively honor and celebrate with your mom and uh, the mother in your life to have a great day next Sunday. But then we'll start our Bible class up after that. And we'll